So second speaker is Tom Skirman, who's from a family, fam family farming family, um, has his own farming interests, been an Uffield scholar, um, but Tom's on the Hawke's Bay Regional Council, Group Manager of Strategic Planning, and um, responsible for progressing Hawke's Bay policy of regulatory framework for natural resource management. So um, it'd be interesting to hear from you, Tom. Oh, so thanks very much and good morning um, everybody. It's a, um, can, that you can hear me down the back there? Um, look, uh, just look, thanks for the opportunity uh, to present here uh, today. Um, look, it's a pretty tough gig putting regulation up second um, over a three day event, so, so bear with me. I'm not going to get too dry on you, but I just want to take this opportunity uh, to thank you for the opportunity for Hawke's Bay Regional Council uh, to support um, this event. Um, and so in doing so, to support grasslands, um, to support um, you know, the organisations you represent, and probably more importantly, to, uh, to support the work uh, that you do um, as individuals. And, and in particular, I think I'm, I'm looking ahead here and, and in anticipation support uh, the work that needs to be done um, because you know these are incredibly interesting and um, exciting and challenging times and and, and look and I have um, I think I've got 15 minutes I've got uh, four slides and I've got uh, one message and, um, and 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 so you're going to bear with me because it's probably not exactly what you're expecting to hear from uh, someone from regional council. Uh, but I just really want to point out that you guys are mission critical to a very important change that's going on in farming uh, right now. And, uh, and that's in particular, is, is, is my observation from where I stand, is that we're at the end game of creating an entirely new industry based around an entirely new property right. And so I just want to walk you through why I think that is and why I think you've got such an important role to play. So... Um, uh, this, is a, um, uh, this is a photo uh, designed to unashamedly ingratiate me to the audience here because I thought if I put a photo up juxtaposing me next to a statue, uh, statue of Dr Norman Borlaug, you'd have sort of more empathy for me and see me as more of a human being. Um, uh, this is a photo that was taken in Mexico um, when I was on my Nuffield scholarship and I think it speaks to you know, the incredible um, power of what happens when you meld science and, um, and, and practice um, and we all know that Dr Norman Borlaug was the, uh, the founder or the, or the father of the Green Revolution that um, you know, has, has reaped such enormous benefits across the world. And, uh, but another reason for putting the slide up was because it was taken in 2016. And 2016 actually ended up proving to be a very interesting year. And um, when we started the year, there was uh, no Brexit and no Trump. And at the end of the year, the world had pretty much shifted um, irreversibly on its political axis. axis and, uh, and, and, the cha and the changes have been profound. And uh, 2016 sort of proved the adage that um, history doesn't crawl, it leaps. And I believe that farming is in a moment right now where it's leaping and... Uh, and, and, and you guys are kind of at ground zero of the, of the challenge that's uh, taken in terms of the transformation. And so, look, we've been here before. I'm going to put up a slide that I don't want you all to um, be too shocked with, but um, you all remember this guy, and you all remember what he did um, and through his economic reforms. And, and we can talk a long time about the legacy of this guy, but really one, one simple fact is he, that he unleashed ultimately a wave of productivity, innovation, growth, and expansion in the primary sector, um, and it transformed the industry. And so now we have a new sheriff in town, and, uh, and this guy's also got an agenda. And through the Healthy Waterways and the Essential Fresh Water Reform Package, um, which ironically is, you know, in some respects been introduced to you know, manage the legacy effects of the economic reforms of his predecessor, uh, but this guy is uh, challenging the primary sector and challenging you know, everyone in this room uh, to uh, come up with a new equation. Um, and I'd probably, I'd, I'd probably in some respects say come up with a new algorithm, and I'm not sure whether that's the right term, and I'm technically, um, you know, technically uh, you're inferior in this, so I'll let you correct me on that. 
But this algorithm, um, he's, he's, he's challenging the primary sector to come up with. Uh, he's demanding that it not only solves for the business, that the, equa that the productivity equation must not only solve for the business, but it must solve for the environment. And that's an enormous challenge. And this equation actually sits at the centre of uh, a new licence to operate that is emerging. And through his national reform package, I think, is in the, is in the end stage of being completely formalised. And this is not just a social licence to operate, but it's a regulatory licence to operate. And that's a profound difference. And um, I want us just to talk through and think, well, what are the implications of this regulatory um, requirement through farm plans and through consents? And I would argue that there's actually not a lot of difference between a farm plan and a consent. What, is, what are the implications for that? So I'm going to get a little bit pointy-headed um, at the moment, and I'm going to put in front of you some of the probably the worst slide you'll ever see in your life, just through its sheer amateurishness. Um, I just I just have not, no graphic skills, so this is the best I could do. I want you to think of that um, that as a farm, and I want you to think of that as a farming property in the uh, in the traditional form of ownership. And the traditional form of ownership really was simple effect, effective ownership. So if you had a certificate of title, that defined not only your occupancy rights, it defined your exclusivity rights in terms of what other people couldn't do on your property, and it also defined your activity rights in terms of what you could do on the property. And this was the historic model, and I suppose this is where we get the saying, you know, my home is my castle. And because effectively, if you had title, if you owned a property, you could pretty much do anything that you wanted with it. In more recent times and decades, and certainly since the introduction of the Resource Management Act, but before that, uh, we kind of got a bit funky and we added a couple of layers and things, you know, these funny things called consents, which sort of created some rules and, and regulation around, you know, sort of things you could take off the land or how, you, how would you, get, you would get water onto the land or how you would modify the landscape, but they still hadn't reached into, you know, how would you conduct activities on the property. Um, and in a time of abundance, these were really just simply expenses. They were just effectively administrative burdens. You know, they were things that you did to try and increase your revenues. But in a times of abundance, you know, there was no real scarcity around this, so off you went. Uh, but clearly we don't live um, in a time um, of abundance anymore. Um, and, we, uh, and so my view is that it's the, it's the fact that we are now talking about much uh, more focus around scarcity of resources and the new scarce resource is the resource or is the asset of production. And so my view is that we are right at the moment and the, uh, and the national regulation that's coming in is really sort of the, the, the end game of this is that we are unbundling traditional property rights. And so they are unbundled into... Um, is that going to work? Oh, there you go. What's the top one? Oh, OK. So I've just been fluking it to this point. Um, so we're unbundling property rights, OK? Uh, and what we do is that, um, on one form, we still have traditional ownership uh, in the form of occupancy and exclusive, exclusivity rights, which are effectively reflected in your title. But we are creating this new right that sits on top, and this new right I'm going to call uh, a productivity right. And remember uh, what I said earlier, is that this productivity right has to solve not only for the business, but it has to solve for the environment. And, and the fact that I'm calling this a right is because you actually have to earn this. You, have, you actually have to articulate this, and you have to capture this in the form of a farm plan, or increasingly a consent. And um, that is effectively, you know, that is the regime that is coming in piecemeal around the country through catchment plan changes. And those of you familiar with the Tuki Tuki catchment know this, you know, very well. And it's, you know, very raw issue right now. Uh, but the reforms that are being introduced, and look, I'll admit that we we don't know exactly how they're going to land. But I don't think you know, how and how they come in. And regulation has a habit of coming in too late and too hard. Um, and, and this may, you know, support that. But um, we are, um, I, I don't think we're going to see these roll back. And so what are the implications of this unbundling of, um, of ownership? 
Um, and the first thing is I really want to, and I really want to emphasise this, because this is why the work that you do is so mission critical, is that whereas traditionally this concept of you know, consents and things like that were something that really focused on the profit and loss, and they were sort of expenses and administration hassles, do not make the mistake of not understanding that these productivity rights are assets. And I'm going to argue, and I think, that they are the second most valuable asset for a farming business. And so, um, the, so the work that you do, um, for the people in this room, you've got to think that this conversation has shifted from the profit and loss statement to the balance sheet because this is about the value of the business and the, and the productive potential and capacity of the business. And so we think if we, and it's logical, isn't it? Because if you unbundle property rights, you unbundle the values associated with those rights. So for me, it raises a, really, a couple of really interesting questions. It raises a lot of interesting questions, actually, but I'll just deal with two of them here. What the hell is this worth? Because if we say that, now that I know that this thing's there, if we say that that is not a single farm, but all the farmland in New Zealand and all the arable and horticultural land in New Zealand, what's that worth? Now, I've tried to try and figure this out, and I've tried to ask people exactly what is this all worth, and um, I come up with such a range of answers. But I'm going to say it's several hundred billion dollars, OK? The value of, you know, of, of land in New Zealand, of, of productive land in New Zealand. And now we've actually carved that out and split it out and divided that into a productivity right. So what on earth is this productivity right worth? Is it 5% of the business? Is it 10% of the business? Or is it more? Is it 30% of the business? And we can take some guidance from understanding the value that water adds to a property um, to make some suggestions here. So I think whichever way you cut the mass, this is worth billions and billions of dollars. And it's the role of you guys to A, um, define the productivity rights. What is the algorithm that solves for the, um, for the business and solves for the environment? And, and in total, or perhaps in terms of some of the building blocks of the work that's done, that solves this riddle. So you actually have to be able to define it, and then you have to be able to protect it. You have to be able to secure it for the business, because if you don't secure it for the business, that creates another really interesting question because we're talking about scarcity. We're talking about productivity being a scarce resource. And we all know what scarcity does. It creates markets and it creates opportunity and it creates winners and losers. And just think, you know, just do the thought experiment. If a, if a subcatchment is now deemed for whatever, whether it's elegant or entirely ele inelegant regulation, it's deemed to have a, a cap on its productive potential then we're potentially facing a situation where we have the quick and the dead a little bit. Because the first movers, those who actually move to understand this issue and, and capture for their property, maximise their productive potential, potentially are doing so at the expenses of others if there's a finite level of productivity available in a subcatchment. So when I'm talking about productivity, I'm obviously talking about farm systems. I'm talking about nutrient availability and allocations. And so the parallels with water are, um, are, are quite extraordinary because we know what's happened with the allocation of water. Those who were the first movers in this area actually secured a lot of value for their business over time and created options for them in the future. So, so I think uh, what's happening right now is quite profound and I just can't emphasise enough how important the work that you are doing and how, and how I think the, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the stakes of what you do is, uh, have, have risen um, extraordinarily high. So I don't know how I'm going for time. Two minutes. So I've got two minutes, so I'm going to make two points. Um, um, the first point is that... Um, this is extremely frightening, and it's frightening for um, one simple reason, is that, uh, that when we think of that ownership model, you can trace the origins of that ownership model back to 1086 in the writing of the Doomsday Book. And so we have nearly a 1,000 years of law, of jurisprudence, of legislation, of institutions, of cultural understanding of what it is to own something. This productivity right, we're still writing the rules. We've rewritten them in terms of the national policy statement for freshwater management about three times in the last decade, and we're, we're rewriting the entire book right now through, when I say we, um, you know, um, government is. And so, you know, and so, you know, no one business doesn't like uncertainty. So there's, a, you know, there's, there's, 
it's very difficult to understand what the single point of truth is. And what's even more frightening is who owns that single point of truth, because whereas if you want to own something, there's somewhere you can go, if you want to own a piece of property, that tells you what, what that is and how you own that, and it's called Land Information New Zealand, and it's the entire title system. But who is the arbiter, who is the single point of truth for a farm's production system? Does anyone have a guess? Who, who, who has been tasked with defining this? It's me. <laughs> it's regional councils have been tasked with us in the first instance and then the RMA system. And so this is an enormous task for us to, uh, to, to, to figure out how to solve this. So that was the uh, frightening part. So I better finish on the exciting part. Um, the exciting part is that this is a licence to innovate. It is, a, it is a licence to go out and solve this algorithm, solve this problem, and through the work that you do, because you know, it is so vital to you know, first protecting and then building on the productive capacity of New Zealand's farming system. And the, um, and the author, Matt Ridley, um, describes this period right now as a period in which ideas are having sex with other ideas with increasing promiscuity. And it's the simple fact is that, you know, it's, you know, in terms of to be in the space that you're in right now is an incredibly exciting time because, you know, because science, technology, information, particularly though when, when, when those disciplines move onto digital platforms and then interact with each other, you know, creates a huge amount of opportunity and innovation. Now, technology clearly provides a double-edged sword, and I imagine Melissa may talk about both sides of those sword um, in a few moments. But, you know, nonetheless, it is an incredibly exciting challenge. Um, it sits with you. Please consider consents and farm plans to be assets. They are incredibly important. If, 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 if a couple of grand or something like that work in innovation helps you secure the right to um, continue your operation for 20 years, I think that's pretty cheap. And, um, and I think we need to embrace the fact that um, there's opportunity in here. So, look, have a fantastic uh, few days. Uh, the Hawke's Bay has really turned it on for you. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Regional Council is happy to support you in the work uh, that you've done, but more importantly, the work you're about to do. So thanks very much.